There we go. Hello and good morning, everyone. I am Shauna Butts. I'm the assistant curator here at the Niagara Lake Museum, and I will be your host and your question master for today's virtual lecture. Um, if for whatever reason you cannot stay for the entire thing, or if you're having any technological issues um, during today's presentation, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and it is being recorded so you can all watch it at a later date. There will be time uh, for questions at the end, so please use the chat box or the Q&A functions at any time during the talk and at the end I will field them to Josh. So today, Joshua Poole from the Niagara Falls Underground Railroad Heritage Center will be presenting the Borderland Black Agency and Resistance Between Two Nations. Joshua is a Western New York native and graduated from Sunny Genesco with a BA in history. His senior thesis focused on history of communication networks amongst enslaved people. Josh applies his research at the Niagara Falls Underground Railroad Heritage Center where he works as the visitor experience specialist and the operations specialist. He also works on many other initiatives, including researching free black communities in New York and their role in anti-slavery efforts for the New York State Underground Railroad and Harriet Tubman Corridor. Joshua, thank you so much for joining us this morning and I am going to hand things on over to you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. It's an honor to be able to speak for you all today. Uh, unfortunately, um, I cannot see you all, but I hope you're all doing well. Um, one thing I did want to mention is that I am a social historian. So what I mean by that is I study people, right? I study society. And oftentimes, uh, well, actually, if you think about the life that you live right now, if you think about all the things that you're involved in, your, your job, your hobbies, whatever you're involved in, your relationships with other people, you think about all the different ways that people view the world with, um, my job is to kind of take all that <laughs> and break it down into an understanding, right? And it's difficult to do that if you think about the current world that we live in. And when people study the past, people don't always view it this way. Um, when you talk about the Underground Railroad, people love to pick out a few people, you know, guy behind me, Frederick Douglass, uh, Harry Tubman, and say, well, yes, we should honor their stories, but also the life that they lived, you know, most other people live that, et cetera. And so what I hope to do for you all today is to give you a sense of what it was like for the average ordinary person on the Underground Railroad. And so I'm gonna share my screen for you all now. And as you can see here, um, what I'll be talking about today is the borderland, right? Black agency and resistance between two nations. And again, when people have talked about the Underground Railroad in the past, well, what do they say? Oh, Harriet Tubman, uh, she made it to the promised land. But what exactly is the promised land? And that's what we will explore that today. Um, can we just generalize it into a single word? Or if we look at the actual people who lived in the area that we live today, hundreds of years ago, and how they lived their life, could it tell us a little bit more about this history? So we'll get started here. Just wanna briefly go over the table of content. So first off, I wanna talk about the historiography. Um, this I will explain in a moment here, um, but whenever you are trying to learn about a new subject in history, whenever you're trying to study anything in the past, I always recommend starting off with the historiography and we'll talk about that in one moment. Uh, next, we'll talk about the final stop of the Underground Railroad. So over here on my side of the pond, we'll talk about the final stop before people escape to Canada. Um, and the reason why I titled this the borderland is because back then people didn't, at least the black community here, the people who were part of the Underground Railroad, they didn't necessarily identify it as purely Canadian or purely American, right? And we'll get more into that in a bit moments. Um, and so really when I'm talking about these areas, Although I might be describing, uh, you know, Niagara Falls in the U.S., oftentimes the lives that people lived were very similar in many other parts of Canada and St. Catharines, Niagara on the Lake, etc. Uh, and then we're going to get more in depth with Canada, right? Talking about the Promised Land, and then lastly, we'll have a Q and A. All right, so let's get started. 
historiography. Uh, there's a fancy definition, and then also here's the definition that I prefer. So historiography is the history of how historians have written history. And that's a bit wordy, <laughs> um, a lot of history, but what I always like to ask people is, well, what is history? And oftentimes when I ask that question, I get a very similar response, which is it's just what happened in the past. And that's not always quite true. Um, really history is what we know about the past based upon what has been written about it or what has been left behind. And if you think about the history of slavery in North America, do you think a lot of testimonies, a lot of stories are left behind from enslaved people themselves? Um, unfortunately not. And this is for a wide range of reasons, right? Uh, enslaved people in the US were prevented from education, um, were prevented from having access to resources such as paper and quill and ink, right? So they didn't always necessarily leave behind their records, their stories. And what this has caused is we don't always focus on their stories. And this is what Black History Month is about, right? This is why I'm here speaking to you all today. Because um, it recognizes that in the past 150 years, when people have talked about this history, they haven't always placed a focus on stories of Black agency and resistance. And that's why it was started in 1925, right? It was started by a Black professor who noticed that his white colleagues didn't always try to understand the experience of an enslaved person or a black person in the US. And so what I wanna start off here is looking at, well, how people have written the history of the Underground Railroad. And you'll notice that it'll change over time. And also, however, the way we understand the past, although it might be incorrect, it has influenced how we understand it today. So I wanna show you the first two books, well, not the first two, but the first few academic, and I put that in quotes, books written on the Underground Railroad. Um, everyone knows Uncle Tom's Cabin. I didn't include that, that's a fictional book, but uh, that kind of does influence people's ways. And it's very similar to some of the things that we're gonna talk about with these books. So the first book I written here, uh, this is from 1851. This is a year before Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, this was published by Samuel Cartwright. Now, the reason why Samuel Cartwright wrote this book was because the Medical Association of Louisiana had asked him to figure out and explain why so many enslaved people were running away. And Cartwright wrote this book as a way to explain it. And what he did was he invented this diagnosis called drapetomine. And what this diagnosis said was that an enslaved person didn't want to run away because, you know, slavery was bad and obviously that's what you would want to do and said no an enslaved person according to cartwright ran away because they literally had a mental disease that influenced them to do so and this shows how many people during that time period literally thought about the underground railroad um, especially in the south right people couldn't imagine that an enslaved person would want to run away simply because they're enslaved and so they invented this whole disease to kind of explain why they would do so. And this influences a lot of the ways that we understand it today, because it sets a foundation where it removes the agency of enslaved people. Now, the second book here from 1898, uh, this was written by a Ohio, Ohio State professor, um, Wilbur Siebert. And this is pretty much the book that influences how we understand the Underground Railroad today. And Wilbur Siebert, uh, he saw a painting of the Underground Railroad that influenced him to write this book. And what he decided to do is since this was, you know, 1898, he realized many people who were a part of the Underground Railroad were getting older, um, many were passing away. He wanted to try to record their testimony um, so that we could understand it in the future. So he sent out a questionnaire. And this questionnaire contained questions like, did you ever help someone escape? Um, were you on the Underground Railroad, et cetera? Simple stuff like that. Um, now, there's one common denominator between every single one of the responses to this questionnaire. You got about 3,100 responses. Um, the majority of them were white people, right? And if you look at society at this point in the 1890s, early 1900s, all of a sudden, the Underground Railroad was 
kind of massively popularized. And a lot of people during this time period felt that they wanted to get, you know, a say in this history, right? They wanted to say, oh yeah, like I was a part of this thing that helped people escape. And so what this has happened is it resulted in this, this story, right? That the Underground Railroad has a focus on these abolitionists, these white abolitionists in the North and not a focus on the actual people who escaped. And so what you have here is a bunch of stuff like this, right? Uh, these are some quotes I pulled from the books as well as some other books as well. And in the middle there, you have the painting that influenced Wilbur Sieber. And what you see in this painting is you have this old enslaved man who looks like he just escapes and he's depicted as helpless. He's depicted as, you know, needing someone to kind of take him to freedom in the North. And as you can see around here, you have a bunch of different quotes. On the left, I put a single word, freight. Uh, that is what Wilbur Sieber refers to the enslaved people who escaped on the Underground Railroad. He literally calls them freight, right? Describing them as kind of inanimate objects that are just kind of strung along this, this train system. Over on the right, uh, how many times do you think Wilbur Sieber mentioned Harriet Tubman? Uh, just this once. And when he mentioned Harry Tubman, he said Harry Tubman, the abductor, meaning she was a person who had to go into the South and abduct or entice enslaved people away. As in, on their own, they wouldn't want to escape. But if you had someone who wanted to abduct them or entice them, then they would want to escape. And then at the top here, you see another description. Uh, this is from 1959, so much more recent, right? There are elements in the very structure of the plantation system it's close character that could sustain infantilism as a normal feature of behavior. And this is saying, well, enslaved people acted like infants, right, on their plantation. Um, they're saying that life was so difficult during enslavement that uh, enslaved people would act as if they didn't want to escape, as if they were helpless, as if they were sub, you know, subordinate, as their subservient, etc. And then lastly, that quote at the bottom is about is from Wilbur Siebert's book. And you can see here, it's kind of described as this, almost this drama, right? This mythologized, dramatic, like, event. And all of it has done is has removed the agency of enslaved people, right? Um, and so today, what I'm hoping to do is to kind of give a different picture, right? And that all starts with the language that I use. Um, if you notice the entire time I've been saying enslaved people, oftentimes when you hear or read about this history, they always use the word slave. And that's the same exact word that they used in the 1850s. Except for back then, a slave wasn't a human being, right? It was a piece of property that they could sell, that they could do whatever to. And so I refused to use that word. Instead, I used enslaved people because that recognizes that they were human beings that they had intelligence, they had agency, and they had definitely the capability to resist and to escape on their own. And so the Underground Railroad, it was never this completely organized system where you had this, you know, super secret network of people who were expertly helping other people escape. It wasn't always that. Oftentimes, it was just individual decisions made, made by enslaved people in the South who decided that they were going to take a chance and to escape, who had, you know, were not always aware of opportunities to help them um, and just decided they were going to go for it. And so we're going to be looking at that in the last stop of the Underground Railroad, the area where we live today. So I also want to just briefly do a, a quick timeline here just to give a sense of this time period. Um, this is focusing on slavery in Canada. So enslaved people were first brought to Canada in the 1600s by the French. Um, that was until the 1760s when the British took over Canada, established British Canada, British North America. Um, now the American Revolution began shortly after that. And of course, this is a lot of generalization. Um, this is over 100 years, hundreds of years. Um, so just giving brief timestamps here. Um, but 1776, the American Revolution begins. And two things happen here. On one hand, you have British people in the 13 colonies who were loyal to Britain and who decided that they were going to escape to Canada to find freedom for them there, 
Now, as they escaped to Canada, they brought enslaved people with them to Canada as well. So you also have enslaved people being introduced to Canada through that way. At the same time, and I, um, I noticed, um, I believe in the Niagara Lake Museum, the story of Mosey, Robert Mosey. I hope I got that name right. Hopefully, maybe someone will have to correct me there. Um, you have people like Robert Mosey, who he was an enslaved person in the US um, during the American Revolution. He saw that the British were offering freedom to enslaved people who would join the British army and train in their military and fight for the British. So that is another way that you have free black people arriving in Canada as well. Now, it isn't until 1793 with um, the act to limit slavery that you first have um, the abolishment of slavery in Canada in certain parts of Canada, mostly Ontario, the area that we're talking about today. Um, this was uh, in response to Glo Cooley and her attempt to escape into the US from Canada. Um, word got out about her capture, right? And how they treated her. And it inspired a lot of anti-slavery sentiments. Um, and eventually John Simcoe was the one who kind of pushed this through. So at this point now in 1793, Canada becomes the first safe haven from for enslaved people in the US to escape there. Um, now, next we have the War of 1812. And this is how word of Canada begins to spread to enslaved people in the U.S. Um, because what you have is you have a lot of southern U.S. military officers going up north to fight in the War of 1812. And these southern military officers bring their enslaved servants with them. And when they return to the south after the war, those enslaved servants start spreading word about the north, right? This, this place called Canada and how they saw free Black people there who had freedom. And all of a sudden, word of it spreads as being a destination of freedom. Now, it isn't until 1834 that the British Empire abolishes, Canada, uh, abolishes slavery. So now uh, there's freedom in all of Canada. And the real reason um, why we hear so much about Canada um, and why so many people start escaping to Canada is because of the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850. So the federal government passed this act, and this was in response to um, westward expansion, where new states coming into the U.S. were, you know, arguing over will there be slavery in those states or not. This act was passed in order to appease the South. And what it said was that bounty hunters from the South could now legally go into the North and chase after and capture formerly enslaved people and return them to the South. Now the North was a place where if you were enslaved and you had escaped there, you were now at risk of being recaptured. And Canada really became one of the few destinations where their freedom was guaranteed if they made it there. So today we're really talking about the decade of the 1850s, right? This is when the majority of people escaped on the Underground Railroad, uh, including Harry Tubman and all those names we know. Um, and also this is when the area that we all live in played an immense important uh, piece in this history. So my question to start off with, and actually let me just check the chat here. Solomon Mosby or Richard Pierpoint. Yeah, there's, thank you for, for um, confirming that. Yeah, there's, you know, there's always a few, few people, right, who had similar stories like this, but yes, thank you for, for sharing that information. Yeah, so my question for you all today is, if you're traveling to Niagara Falls in the 1850s, what would it look like, right? What would be there? Who would you see? What would be going on? Um, and try to imagine placing yourself into that city, that atmosphere, that society. And so I threw this image in here, and this is actually the first answer to my question. Uh, this is an image of, of course, the Niagara River, but all the factories along the river. Now, this image is from much later, um, but most of the buildings that you see in this image were from 1861, right? So they would have existed at the end of this time period. Now, a lot of these factories were textile factories. They produced fabric, produced clothing, and to produce that clothing, they needed a certain raw resource to do so, and that was cotton, right? Cotton that was farmed by enslaved people in the South. And so these factories here were absolutely pro-slavery. 
And actually in New York City, in Red Hook Bay, that was the largest warehouse for storing cotton from the South. Now in New York City, there was not a single factory to process that cotton. So all of that cotton was sent upstate into areas like Niagara Falls and to other areas as well. So you had a huge industry in Niagara Falls that profited off of slavery. And so you do have people in the city who were pro-slavery. Now, on the other hand, um, it is not the largest uh, industry here in Niagara Falls. And this goes for both US and Canadian side. Um, this was the hospitality industry, right? For thousands of years, going back to indigenous times, people have always been interested in visiting, seeing the falls, et cetera. And so mostly you have hotels, you have restaurants, you have businesses in order to support that industry. So that is another group. And we're gonna talk a whole lot about them later on um, who is here. But real quick, one other group I want to address is abolitionists, right? Now, I know I started off with a spiel about how we focus too much on abolitionists, but I'm also trying not to deny that they did and were, did assist on the Underground Railroad. Um, but I wanna take a look at some of these abolitionist societies to just give you a sense of what it felt like to be in that city in the 1850s. So we'll take a step forward here. Um, so first off down here in the left-hand corner, that's Red Hook Bay in New York City. You can see all the boats coming in from the south carrying all these bales of cotton that would eventually be shipped up north. And then inside there is uh, the inside of a textile mill. Now this photo is from 1901. Um, so again, much later, but similar to what it would have looked like during the 1850s, 1860s, et cetera. Now over here, I also have um, three different abolitionist groups listed and you probably recognize a few of them. Um, the first one here, is called the New York Society for Promoting the Manumission of Slaves. This was the first ever abolitionist society created in the US. Um, if anyone is a fan of Hamilton, uh, Alexander Hamilton was a part of this society. Now the president of the society was John Jay. John Jay owned 17 enslaved people as the president of the society. And so that doesn't make sense, right? Um, you have this peculiar history where when we view these abolitionist societies, we think, oh, they were anti-slavery, so they must have actually been anti-slavery and that they also must have been completely for equality, et cetera, or equity. But that's not always the case. You have many cases such as this where there's a huge difference between bystanders and upstanders, right? A bystander is a person who they publicly state that there's something, but they don't uphold it with their actions versus an upstander who is a person with integrity, right? They say, I am anti-slavery and I'm gonna show that by petitioning the government, by donating money to organizations who help take people in in Canada or who take it to you know the final step, right? I am going to physically help someone escape. And this is similar for these other two. Uh, Ladies New York City Anti-Slavery Society was a group of about 200 women who were anti-slavery. However, they are also extreme segregationists. They did not allow black members to join their society. Uh, the Society Friends, this is probably the most popular one, uh, also known colloquially as Quakers. Quakers were also a little bit segregated. They did allow black members. However, they forced them to sit on separate benches. And also they were um, pretty against black suffrage. So although, you know, they saw slavery in the US, they said morally they were against it. They did not view black people as equal to them. And they believed that they shouldn't have the right to vote. And so keep that in mind as we talk about the city, right? And the, the story of the Underground Railroad in it. Um, for the most part, it is a sanctuary city, right? It's a city where it's safe to escape to. And you have people in this city who are willing to help you and to, you know, provide a sanctuary for you. Um, however, there's two sides to the story, right? And we don't always recognize the other side. Um, there is tension in this city, right? If imagine an enslaved person, right? A freedom seeker coming to the city. They don't always know who they can trust, who they can reach out to, who can they risk to ask questions to, et cetera. I have another side uh, demonstrating this as well. I just going to go ahead and skip ahead of this. This just shows you, again, a few more examples from other states in the U.S., such as Indiana, Illinois, 
um, those states in the North that we have this perception that were extremely anti-slavery, but that's not always the case if you actually look into them. Now, this is what I really want to get to. So I mentioned earlier the largest industry in Niagara Falls, and this is, goes for both sides, was the hospitality industry. And you had many hotels that popped up to support that. And also, um, and I'll get to this in a moment, the most, the largest hotel, the Cataract House Hotel. Now, this hotel here that you're looking at is James Patterson's Free Soil Hotel. Uh, James Patterson was born enslaved in Kentucky. And at some point in the 1830s, he walked all the way up here to Niagara Falls to work here as a free person. Now, for 15 years, he worked for the Cataract Hotel, which I'll show you in one moment here. And he was a porter. So he took people's luggage as they came in from the train and brought it to the hotel. So he had this kind of connection to people who were visiting from all over the world, whether it be from the South, whether it be from the North or other countries as well. So he had access to information, right? Uh, he could listen in to conversations. He could hear rumors that were going around. Now, after 15 years of working at the Cataract Hotel, uh, James Patterson earned enough money where he could establish his own hotel called the Free Soil Hotel. And the Free Soil was a political party in the US that was anti-slavery. And so by branding his hotel as the Free Soil Hotel, he was sending a message, right? He was saying that this is what I am about. I am anti-slavery. And if you are visiting from the South and you are an enslaver, you're not staying at my hotel. Now, at the same time, for freedom seekers who were escaping to the North, all of a sudden, maybe they know where to go now. Where was James Patterson's home before he moved to Canada? So good question. Um, he, I believe, lived in the back of his hotel. So on the Falls side, that would be right about where Old Fall Street is. So we're talking right downtown. So you have like the Turtle Building, you have the Red Roof Inn. Hims was like across the streets, right down in that downtown area. Now he built his hotel in 1849. Um, a year later was the Fugitive Slave Act. So unfortunately, very shortly after he established his hotel, he had to sell it and move it to Canada. So James Patterson gives us an example of the free black community here that was in Niagara Falls. And this is really the, the focus of our presentation here. Um, so I wanna move forward here to the heart of Niagara Falls, right? This is the Cataract House Hotel. This was the largest hotel here in Niagara Falls. You can see in the bottom right corner, there is an image of it. It sat right actually across the street from James Patterson, um, right downtown, right in Niagara Falls right on the river there, you can see at the bottom of the image. And this hotel, um, you can see here, they employed an entirely black wait staff. And about 80% of these waiters were people who were formerly enslaved and who at some point had escaped all the way up north and arrived here and worked in this hotel as free people. So in the bottom left corner here, you can see the breakfast room in the Cataract Hotel. And this is where the waiters would have worked. Um, over at the end there, you can see the doors into the kitchen. Let's see, I have another question here. We helped out to the, oh, that's just, um, so going back to that, that image right there. So that, that person, um, that's supposed to be a, a ladder. Um, they're just painting the roof. This is supposed to be down here in the suit. That's James Patterson. This is just an image supposed to be showing you the opening of his hotel. So they're still painting it right there. So going back to the Cataract Hotel, right? At these tables you see here, you had mostly white patrons. Now this, this hotel served both black and white patrons, but you had mostly white patrons. And we have all of the registries to the Cataract Hotel. So we know every single person that has ever stayed in this hotel. And we know that 20% of them were Southerners who owned enslaved people. One of our historians very tediously traced them all back. And so they're sitting here at these tables, eating dinner, eating breakfast. And they might say, you know, we just 
visited, we just came from Alabama and we brought two enslaved people with us to carry our luggage while on vacation. Now, do you think these waiters who are serving them hear that conversation? Absolutely, right? They hear that conversation. Um, and at the same time, every day, they are checking the registry to see who is visiting and where they're visiting from. And what they're doing is they are looking out for people who were coming from the South and who were enslaved here. Now, oftentimes when we think about this past, we think, oh, once you step over the border into New York, you are instantly freed. But that's not how it worked back then. In New York, there was a law that stated that enslaved people could be brought to New York. As long as they were brought out of the state within nine months, they were still legally enslaved. So this happened quite often, right? Again, 20% of these visitors to this hotel brought enslaved people with them. And so when those enslaved people were brought here, all of a sudden they have an opportunity um, because to do their job, right? If they were carrying the luggage, if they had to change the bed sheets, if they had to cook for their enslavers, they would have to interact with these black waiters that you see up here in the top right, right? And all of a sudden they now have an opportunity, right? Because these waiters could say, hey, come with me. We can help you get to Canada. It's pretty close just across the river to freedom. So over here on the left-hand picture, this is an excerpt from the Cataract House Registry. And over on the right here, we have this image of John Morrison. And this is actually the only known image of what he looked like. Now, John Morrison, he was the head waiter at the Cataract House Hotel. Uh, we don't know too much about his backstory, if he was enslaved or not. All we do know is he worked as the head waiter for the Cataract Hotel in the 1850s. And he was the guy who was running this whole operation. Now, if you look over here in the registry, and I hope you all can kind of see my cursor here, um, the fourth from the bottom entry, Rachel Smith. Uh, she visits on this date. Now, Rachel Smith, she was an abolitionist who knew John Morrison. Now, when she came on vacation here to the Cataract Hotel, she wasn't actually doing any work for the Underground Railroad. Um, it was literally just a three-day vacation for her. Now, in Rachel Smith's diary, she wrote down how she noticed that during the night, John Morrison was helping people escape out of the hotel multiple times. Now, John Morrison, as head waiter of the Cataract House Hotel, he made really good money. And he actually owned a boat that sat down at Niagara Falls. And it sits right about where the Maid of the Mist is today right at the bottom of the steps there. And so during the day, again, John Morrison would be doing his job as head waiter, but then he would learn about an enslaved person being held there. And he would help them get out of the hotel. They would make their way along the shore of the river to the top of the falls, where they'll climb down 294 steps to the bottom of the falls and get in his boat and cross to Canada. To free. So let's take a look at a few stories of that. Over on the right here, we have an image of what that looks like, right? So there you can see the American Falls and you can see that staircase going down to the bottom. Um, this was the only way, most prominent way to cross the river in the early 19th century, right? And so you have that boat there. That's again, where the Maiden Mist is today. Now on the left, you see this image of a waiter putting, helping an enslaved woman, right? Um, this enslaved woman, her name is Cecilia Reynolds. Now, Cecilia Reynolds, she was stuck. Uh, she was enslaved in Kentucky. Um, she was brought to the hotel um, sometime in the 1840s. Now, when Cecilia arrives, um, she was, the waiters actually knew about her arrival because a free black boat captain who worked in Lake Ontario had visited a month earlier and possibly tipped them off about her arrival. So she arrives at the hotel, right? And for a few days, unfortunately, she is stuck in the hotel. Um, eventually, she finally gets her chance to escape. Her enslavers, they go to bed and she sneaks out the hotel room in the middle of the night and makes her way down to the lobby of the hotel. What happens is she meets up with one of these waiters, as you can see, and what they do is they make their way out of that hotel and they go down to the falls, 
hop in that boat and cross into Canada into freedom. And we have dozens and dozens and dozens of stories of people like Cecilia who had escaped through this hotel. Now, another way into Canada that I wanna point out for you all here can be seen in this image. So over on the left here, we have an image, a drawing of the International Suspension Bridge. Uh, this was the first bridge built over the Niagara River. Um, it actually stands, well, used to stand right where I am now. So right outside our museum where the Whirlpool Bridge is today, that is where this bridge used to be. Now, 1855, this is in the middle of the height of the Underground Railroad. Um, this is also when Harry Tubman is helping, doing most of her trips, helping people escape. And so once this was built in 1855, this became another opportunity for enslaved people to escape to Canada, um, including Harriet Tubman. Out of 13 of her total trips, eight of her journeys, she crossed this bridge into Canada um, and helping people into freedom. And she helped about, we don't always know exactly, but she about 76 people during the Underground Railroad, she helped to freedom in Canada. Now, she also owned a home, a farm in St. Catharines, where she would kind of stay and lie low at during her trips. Um, and also, you know, take people in for a little bit. You know, you can rest here, you can stay here for a little before you start your life. And unfortunately, when we look at a lot of our primary sources of the stories of people who escaped into Canada, there either is not a lot of information because, well, if you were to write about your escape, you're criminalizing yourself, right? You're creating evidence that someone could use to find you and to, you know, arrest you and bring you back into enslavement. So unfortunately, we don't have a lot of testimony from the people who crossed here. Um, usually evidence pops up in a few letters and it's usually like very just like secret words like, oh, the package made it to Nine Falls, et cetera. Um, but Harry Tubman is very unique um, because a lot of her story was written down by William Still, who was uh, one of the conductors of the Underground Railroad, a free Black man in Philadelphia. And he recorded the testimonies of over 600 people who had escaped on the Underground Railroad. And so we can kind of gain a little sense of what it was like for these people to escape to Canada. And we're going to talk more in depth about that shortly. Now, I also want to point out the story here of this gentleman over on the right. This is Oliver Purnell. Now, Oliver Purnell, um, how he swam across, how, how he escaped across the river, and I just told you, is he swam across the river. So although you had many people who escaped into Canada using the boat, John Morrison's boat, or by crossing across that railroad bridge, you had many people who would escape to Canada by any means necessary. And there are hundreds of unique stories of anything. Um, but I want you to, you know, think about what Oliver was thinking as he stood on that riverbank, right? To him, he definitely saw that current. He definitely knew how dangerous it was. Uh, this was, by the way, where Lewiston is, the Lewiston Crossing. Um, he knew the dangers, absolutely. But to him, it was an all or nothing decision. And for Oliver, he knew that if he didn't make it, he might pass away, he might perish, right, trying to. But to him, uh, it was freedom or nothing. And unfortunately, a lot of people had to make that decision, right? And we don't you know, know exactly how many didn't make it, because again, this history, secretive there's not a lot left behind um but there are many stories where for example an unnamed enslaved man jumps into the river in january of 1850 in the middle of winter right he makes about halfway and this is the only testimony we have is from someone on the shore who saw it happen and, and wrote it down uh they said that he made about halfway until he got tired and he climbed on an iceberg and then luckily, they saw a ferry boat come from Canada and pick him up and bring him the rest of the way. So you have many instances of people who arrived here in Niagara Falls who they, you know, didn't have the opportunity to meet those waiters. Um, 
and they still made an impossible decision to get to Canada by any means necessary. Now, what I want to ask you is, what do you think? And of course, I always preface this by saying, you know, we will never know the actual experiences of an, a pers an enslaved person. But what I want you to think about it is, what do you think was going through the minds of freedom seekers as they made it to Canada? And again, it's always hard to ask this question. Actually, to the right of me, I'll hold this up. This is Penix C. We have two of these. These hold all of the known testimonies of the people who made it to Canada. And if you look at many of these stories, they don't tell you a lot, right? It's a, it's a tiny excerpt from a letter saying, you know, I made it to Canada. Can you please send my clothes along? And one of the really interesting things about a lot of these letters, a lot of these testimonies is that they say, oh, address your letter to the waiters at the Cat Art Hotel. And so at this point, this borderland is very fluid, right? These, this black community, these freedom seekers, they don't, again, as I said earlier, identify as Canadian or American, right? They kind of live in a fluid area where sometimes they're in Canada, sometimes they're in America. Uh, John Morrison, for example, his parents lived over on Lundy's Lane. Um, and he would oftentimes, when pe he brought people over to Canada, say, hey, stay with, stay with them for a little bit. Um, at the same time, John Morrison, he himself lived in Rochester, where Frederick Douglass was. And during the off season, during the winter, when the cataract house wasn't opened, he would live in Rochester. And again, we don't always know, but maybe he did have some contact with Frederick Douglass. And so going back to my question here, right? You have this, this fluidity on this border, um, but what do you think was, were these freedom seekers thinking as they made it into Canada? And oftentimes when I ask this question, um, especially when I do school, like school tours for younger kids, they always say, you know, a feeling of happiness and relief. And that's absolutely true, right? If you look through a lot of these testimonies in the book I just showed you, you can see people where they make it to Canada, as soon as their feet hit Canadian soil, they start shouting towards the sky, they start yelling, they're just, extreme happiness. Absolutely. Um, there's actually one case where Harriet Tubman wrote it down where she helped a man named Josiah Bailey escape into Canada. And she wrote down how uh, the entire journey, Josiah was completely silent. Um, he, his head was down. Uh, he had a very large bounty that would be about $75,000 in today's money on his head. So he knew people were chasing after him, um, trying to get that money. And the entire journey, his he was just completely silent, completely focused on Canada, um, just trying to make that there um, and just scared. And Harry Tubman wrote down that when they finally made it to Canada, uh, Joe Bailey started yelling and, and hollering so much that Tubman noted in her diary that people started stopping and looking at him like he was weird or something. So yes, you have those, absolutely, you have those moments where people feel immense joy. However, on the other hand, you have Harry Tubman's situation. Um, when she first escaped and she crossed the border into Pennsylvania, not Canada, but similar experience, right? Um, she said she looked at her hands and she couldn't recognize who they belonged to. And this was, you know, partly because she was free. She was, you know, about to become a new person. But also it was because she was thinking about all the people who made her who she was. And... Um, all 76, 75 people that she helped free were people in her community, people she loved, uh, her friends, her family. And when she made it to freedom, it wasn't a moment of immense joy. It was a bittersweet feel because she was thinking about all those that she had left behind. And the most common person to escape on the Underground Railroad was someone who was alone. And if you think about it, that's because it's easier, right? It's easier to travel. It's easier to feed one mouth. Again, uh, tr imagine trying to carry a child through the woods at night. It's not going to go well for you. And so the most common person to escape on the Underground Railroad was someone who was alone, and it was a split-second decision. Maybe they had just experienced a brutal beating, 
and they just decided I'm done with this. I'm, I'm just going north. I'm following this river until I try to find a place where I can be safe. And so I imagine a lot of those people, when they arrived in Canada, were thinking the same thing that Tubman was thinking. That bittersweet feeling, oh, well, I, I'm here, I'm free now, but who did I leave behind? Now, the two other things I want to bring, bring up in, in answer to this question um, is a feeling of anxiousness, right? Um, I just had a, a high school tour last week, right? Mostly 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds. And I was trying to ask them, well, what are you going to do in a year, right? How are you going to start your life? And by no means is this a comparison, but they're all anxious, right? How do I provide for myself? How do I find a job? How do I do the things I want to do? And I imagine for the enslaved people escaping to Canada, and again, it's no comparison to high school, um, that they were also thinking about the same things, right? How, how am I going to find a job? right? How am I going to get food, water, a uh, place to live? And at the same time, remember, Canada had abolished slavery completely in 1834. So if someone escapes to Canada in 1835, they might come across a person who literally a year later owned people. And that person is not going to treat them kindly, right? They're going to prevent them from access to resources, right? They're going to say, oh, I don't want you living in my neighborhood, right? So you still have racism. You still have segregation that people are experiencing as they make it into Canada. Now, the other last answer I want to bring up to this question um, is a feeling of disbelief. And what I mean by that is going from enslavement to freedom is a huge, huge change, right? And when we, when historians talk about the experiences of an enslaved person, I've been talking a while here, <laughs> we'll try to wrap it up soon here. Um, when we talk about the experiences of an enslaved person, we say that they experienced a social death, right? Meaning that every part of what makes a human being a human being is removed, right? So you don't have self-autonomy. You don't have decision-making. You don't have relationships with others, right? Because at any moment, your family can be sold away and you may never see them ever again. And so going from socially dead to freedom is a huge change, right? Um, if you ever see an enslaved person named Cujo, uh, C-U-D-J-O-E, that means that that person was born on a Wednesday. And it's quite a common name for enslaved people, right? So you don't even have access to a name, right? Your parents can't name you. And that's something we all take for granted. And so when we talk about freedom seekers as they make it to Canada, I'm sure they're dealing with a lot of questions of wondering who they are and where they come from and, you know, what is their name and what is their parents and where are their parents from and all these sorts of questions. Because um, although we refer to enslaved people as African-American or black, that's really just a blanket term to refer to a large group of people, millions of people who at one point were either Congolese or Ghanaian or Ashante, et cetera. Uh, millions of people who had their own languages, who had their own identity, their own culture, their own belief systems, all these different things that was completely wiped when they were enslaved in the U.S. And now all of a sudden during freedom, they have a chance to maybe try to learn about their past and where they come from. And if you ever talk to anyone who is tracing their genealogy, um, for example, it was very easy for me to trace my genealogy. I, I, it was quite easy for me. I could trace my family back to England and Ireland, et cetera, However, if you talk to, for example, some of my coworkers uh, who are black, it's difficult for them to trace their genealogy or their history. Um, my one coworker, she was able to trace uh, one family member to Alabama, but anything past that, it's, it seems impossible. And with DNA testing, it's a lot easier now, but that doesn't tell you the stories of these people, right? Who they were, who their culture was, what was their life like? Um, it might just tell you a nation of origin, right? And so you have a lot of people dealing with that, a lot of people dealing with trauma, with PTSD as they're in Canada. And it's important to keep that in mind. 
because again, we call Canada, when we talk to this history, the promised land, right? And in many cases, it's not always the promised land. Um, although it was a place of freedom, many people were still dealing with turmoil, still you know, dealing with trauma and also experiencing racist, bigoted people who were not fair, were not kind to them. Now, with that being said, I also wanna point out this article on the right. So although that is true, um, there's also always nuance with history. So this is Hiram Wilson. He was a reverend in St. Catharines. And if you read his obituary here, um, it tells you a lot about his life. Um, just a few things that he did. He started 10 schools for enslaved children, formerly enslaved children um, to educate them when they arrived here in Canada. Um, there's also a few reports from our testimony that he would literally have like care packages ready for enslaved people when they crossed over. And this would include like uh, an ax, a new set of clothes, et cetera, maybe a little money. Um, and so you do have, of course, people in Canada who were willingly upstanders or willingly taking people in and, and helping them, including to go back Oliver Purnell. Oliver Purnell was a very successful businessman when he arrived in Canada, and he actually donated a bunch of land and money to establish the Nathaniel Debt Memorial Chapel. Um, so this, this chapel still exists today. We have many people like him who became successful and who, you know, opened their doors and, and put themselves at risk by doing so, but helped people and took them in. So I wanna end here by discussing this, right? Um, two thirds of the freedom seekers who escaped to Canada would return to the US after the Emancipation Proclamation. And there's uh, many reasons for this. Um, on one hand, as you can see here on the right, you have the Civil War. Uh, there was about, I believe 20,000 um, formerly enslaved people in Canada who returned to the US and joined the Union Army. Those are people who their freedom was guaranteed, um, but they risked that and their lives, many of them their lives, to fight for freedom for other people. Um, however, another reason why two thirds returned to the US was because of some of the things we've been talking about, right? It was not all, you know, sunshine and peachiness over in Canada. Um, and so I always encourage people when they think about the past and where they come from and, and their worldview, always critically think and think with nuance, right? Um, although it's easy to elevate stories of people like Frederick Douglass and who absolutely we should talk about, um, at the same time, people love to grasp onto those stories and imagine that that's how they would be if they lived during that time period. Um, but it's important to recognize the other side of the story. Um, life was still difficult for people after they escaped to Canada. Um, people still fought for decades, decades onwards during Jim Crow, during all these other instances for farther freedoms, right? For farther safety for their families. And it's important to continue to recognize that as we move forward. Um, we all have an obligation to understand where we come from and who we are because we are all the composite of the people who came before us. And things will not get better until we try to understand who other people are and where they come from and have more tolerance. So thank you all. I talked for quite a while there, <laughs> um, but thank you all for, for listening in. Um, and we can open up a Q and A session here. And thank you so much, Josh. Um, I have a question for you, and I really appreciate you bringing up this idea of, you know, Canada being considered like the promised land. And I think over the last um, couple of lectures that we had, uh, especially our previous one on Canada's role in the Civil War, mm -hmm. um, I think this notion of Canada being a promised land is not quite what it was, especially since a number of Canadians um, sided with the South. Mm -hmm. And you've got these people coming up through the Underground Railroad, settling in a community that supports people who enslaved them and a community mm -hmm. that, when the war ended, welcomed with open arms these Confederate soldiers mm -hmm. um, 
who supported the institution of slavery. And so I think we're coming to understand that Canada maybe wasn't always the haven that it was thought to be um, for a really long time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and thank you for sharing that as well. And Canada plays a unique role in that, right? Because it was, as you said, a, a refuge for Confederates as well. Um, and again, it's, it's very easy to generalize the past. Um, and at the same time, for example, um, a lot of times when enslaved people rebelled, whether it be in the South or whether it be in the Caribbean islands, a lot of those enslaved people would also just be sold or sent to Canada as well. And so it was on one hand, a safe haven for people to escape there. On the one hand, you do have slavery in Canada, and it is also refugee for Confederates as well. Um, yes. And I imagine too that, um, you know, you're talking about like the sense of self that these people had when they came to Canada. I'm sure back then there wasn't, you know, any kind of programs in place that, you know, helped them treat um, PTS and other, you know, issues that they were facing coming into Canada? Or do you know of, you know, individuals yeah. who had helped them kind of mm -hmm. transition to a, a more free lifestyle? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's, there can be a long answer to that, right? Um, <laughs> you know, therapy as we think of it today is actually a very new profession. It didn't really exist 200 years ago. I mean, you had other sorts of things. You had like water therapy, which was kind of just like a spa, more like. Um, like Frederick Douglass, he went to a, a water therapy uh, area south of Rochester. Um, so a lot of times these people didn't have help when dealing with these traumas. And there's a really good book I want to give a shout out to. Um, it's called um, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Um, PTSS. And this book really talks a lot about some, you know, things that people dealt with and also how it's passed down to many ways today. Um, and so, yeah, I personally don't, I'm not too knowledgeable about that history, but that's a really good book and I recommend everyone read that. Wonderful. Um, someone has asked, I thought Harriet Tubman was illiterate. Perhaps someone else recorded her feelings about how enslaved people felt. Do you know if this is true? Yeah, so yeah, so Harriet Tubman was illiterate. Um, we call her boots on the ground at the museum because um, she, again, was physically helping people from the north, from the south to the north, unlike Frederick Douglass, who he taught himself how to read and write and who he was kind of the, the organizer, the planner, the fundraiser in the North. So yes, uh, the reason why we have and know about Harriet Tubman was because she had many people write down her testimony. So the first to do it was William Still, who I mentioned earlier. Um, if you look at his notes, um, you'll find this mysterious character known as Moses, who was helping people escape to Philadelphia to where he lived. Um, and then also later in her life, uh, there's many people who wrote her biography. So yeah, I believe when I when I was talking, I said uh, she wrote in her diary. I I didn't mean that. Yeah. So it's just that uh, other people wrote about her. It happens all the time. Like other people wrote about Laura Secor, who was our famous War of 1812 heroine, and mm -hmm. that's how their stories go on. Mm -hmm. Um. Linda Fritz is asking, did people outside the Cataract Hotel know that the waiters were helping get people across the river? From what you said, they must have known what was going on. I was wondering the same thing too. That's a good question. Yeah, so I get that one a lot. Um, yeah, so a few things to keep in mind. Um, for example, I'll tell another story. So there's this, uh, in 1841, this enslaved girl from New Orleans had escaped through the hotel. Now we don't know her name, because when they wrote uh, their down in the registry, they just said the Evans family from New Orleans and a servant. So we don't know her name. We do know that when she escaped to Canada, the Evans family had returned to New Orleans and posted a very long newspaper article that was pretty much uh, a warning saying, don't visit the Cataract Hotel, don't stay there. They help people escape through the hotel. And it tells the entire story of how she escaped, et cetera. 
And so, yes, it's true that word got out about what was going on in the Cataract Hotel. And you do have many instances where like U.S. Marshals would show up and would and the owner would be like, oh, like, I have no idea what's going on, but you can take a look sort of thing. Um, so, yes, but there was never like. I'll hold up my phone, for example, right? It's not like today, right? We live in an information world where we can look up anything at any point. It wasn't like that back then. So I would say there was never a widespread reputation about the Cataract Hotel. Um, it was, again, it was a five-star hotel. It was like the place to be. Um, and it was more known for that versus what was going on in the background. And so you had all sorts of famous people staying there, Abraham Lincoln, Aaron Burr, again, from Hamilton, all these sorts of people staying at this hotel. Um, at the same time, uh, also going back to that letter, um, the, the article that was posted in New Orleans newspaper, uh, imagine if an enslaved person in New Orleans read that article, right? Um, now, of course, we know that most enslaved people were prevented from being taught how to read and write. However, and I always say this, if there were, is a will, there's a way. Just like this guy behind me taught himself how to read, many people in New Orleans would teach themselves how to read, as well as you had a free Black community in New Orleans who would know how to read. And so they would read that newspaper, and um, if you have a chance to read it, it's quite long, but it tells you exactly how to travel from New Orleans to Niagara Falls. And once you arrive in Niagara Falls, it tells you exactly how she escaped into Canada. So it, it's quite funny when you see instances like that because it backfires, right? <laughs> now enslaved people in New Orleans know exactly where to go to and how to get there. Um, so yeah, on one hand, word did get out, but it could also backfire in some ways. Um, hopefully that helps answer that. Um, how long was the Cataract Hotel operating? Good question. So it was constructed in 1825, um, the same well, close to, yeah, same year that the Erie Canal was finished. Um, and it survived until 1945, which cool. it burnt down in 1945. So was, 120 years. So it was around for a while. Mm -hmm. And after it's after it burned down, um, did anything replace it as like a hub of Black culture in Niagara Falls? So good question. Um, right now, there is a park where it used to stand. Um, it used to be called Heritage Park. However, recently we were able to get it renamed to Cataract Park. So we're trying to uh, do some things there to kind of get more recognition for this history. Um, I don't believe I mentioned this actually. The waiters of the Cataract House helped at least a thousand people escape to Canada. Um, and so we're trying to get some plaques there. Well, actually we do have some plaques there that talk about this history as um, the University of Buffalo are currently doing an archaeological dig during the summer. Um, and so they've uncovered the basement of the Cataract Hotel. Um, they got some artifacts from it, which are currently being processed. So we are starting to, you know, give some recognition um, at where it stood. Um, and at the same time, we're also working to establish a monument there as well. Wonderful. That's always good news to hear. Is there a plan? I know a thousand names is a lot of names, but is there any plan to list the names that you do know of? Yeah, so in our records, we have as many testimonies as we could find. Unfortunately, and I'll try to, well, I won't waste your time too much here. A lot of times, if you look at like William Still's notes or Frederick Douglass's notes, they'll just say 46 people crossed in the International Suspension Bridge on this day. So unfortunately, we don't know their names. And it's very hard to find the individual stories. And also, that's also why it's difficult to try to understand the experiences of these people in Canada. Because um, you'll just see a tiny little note or a letter saying, hey, I'm in Canada now. Can you send me my clothes or whatever? And you don't know anything else about those people. Mm -hmm. I found it interesting that um, those abolitionist societies were segregated within them. Mm -hmm. um, why, why was that? Like they seem to support obviously uh, getting rid of um, mm -hmm. slavery in the US but yet it seemed like they didn't have any respect for the people themselves. Yeah, um, and th yeah, that's a good question. And that also comes down to, you know, studying social history. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I always, I always say like, we can never put our present on the past. And what I mean by that is while we may have a definition of abolition or, you know, freedom or equality today, it doesn't mean that they thought the same way about it back then. And so a lot of like, for example, the Quakers, they arrived here, they're one of the very early groups that arrived in North America. And they, from 1600 to 1800 for about 200 years, they were not anti-slavery, right? Um, it wasn't only until the 1800s that many of them, and this, if you look at like the religious text, uh, they would say, oh, we are like morally against slavery due to our religion. However, they didn't view black people as equal to them um, because you still have a lot of white supremacist ideology during this time period, right? Of not understanding or not viewing enslaved people as human beings, first of all, um, and definitely not as equal to them. And so a lot of times people would say, you know, I, I don't want them to vote, you know, against, you know, I don't want them to be brutally treated, but at the same time, I don't think they're intelligent enough to vote. And that's just how many of these groups thought back then, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was doing a, a bit of research and I was shocked when I learned that there were doctors in the Southern United States who thought that um, uh, Black people were not intelligent because their heads at a young age mm -hmm. grew too quickly. And so what doctors tried to do is they performed... Um, operations on children to try and like crack their skulls so that their brains weren't like pushed down and I was like what yeah this is ridiculous mm -hmm. yeah and there unfortunately there's a, a huge history of racial eugenics right mm -hmm. trying to use science to justify racism of course yeah. we know it's not true um, but unfortunately, there's a lot of instances of situations where, like that. Um, and there's luckily in the South, there's a few monuments that have been created to recognize that. Um, however, I also want to say that another white supremacist belief was that black people did not feel as much pain as white people. Absolutely. And so when they were doing these uh, surgeries, as you were just saying, um, they never used anesthesia or any of that because they just simply thought that they didn't feel it because they were, and I'm using quotations with all this, yeah. they're so animal <laughs> that they couldn't feel pain, right? And that, again, is a history we need to recognize. Right? It's a history that's still happening to this day that mm -hmm. pain in people of color is seen as mm -hmm. being less than those who are white. Mm -hmm. And it's traced all the way to back then. And I will um, be touching on that on my lecture next week. <laughs> um, one more person is asking, I think this is me, our last question. Um, did the descendants of the Patterson family continue the family legacy of protecting human rights? Mm. That's a good question. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't know entirely about James Patterson, right? And this is, again, the biggest difficulty with the history of enslavement in North America. Sometimes people's stories, you just don't ever find an ending to it, right? Um, I'm sure, like, when James Patterson, we, we did the math, he earned, like, about, in modern-day money, about $350,000 working as a waiter for the Cataract Hotel. So James Patterson, I'm sure when he had a sell hotel and moved to Canada, I'm sure he continued his, his, like his legacy, like bringing, like he probably let people into his home and, um, you know, gave him a place to stay. I don't have any specific examples of it, but I mean, I would, I don't want to presume, but I think logically it would make sense that he became like, like John Morrison's parents, right? People who took people in. Mm -hmm. And did the Patterson family face any backlash in the community? Um, from, that's a good question. Yeah, so, yeah, from, well, not from the Black community, right? Yeah. Um, on the other hand, yes, you always had that sort of situation in Niagara Falls. And that's why I try to give 
everyone a sense of what it was like to live in Niagara Falls during this time period. Um, because, for example, there is one story where an enslaver brought an enslaved child to Niagara Falls. And while they were in the hotel, one of the waiters had tried to help that child get to Canada, um, but was caught, etc. And so the enslaver grabbed the child, uh, dragged them to the train station and hopped on the train and was ready to, you know, go down south as fast as they could. And what happened was the waiters heard about this. And so they rallied about 200 of these waiters to go and like try to stop the train. Now, at the same time, you had uh, about 300 Irish people who also heard of this and started a race riot. And you had like hundreds of people fighting it out in the street. So you do, you did have that in Niagara Falls, right? And what would happen was the city of Niagara Falls would just, the, the sheriffs would just say, okay, uh, for the next 48 hours, there's no black people allowed in the city. And so you have instances like that, right? So we're outside James Patterson's hotel. They see the name. People get in a fight, a, a scuffle. It's John Morrison has fought with U.S. Marshals as well. It, it happened quite often. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Josh. It doesn't look like we have any more questions left. Um, now, the last time I played host to a lecture, I did mix up the presentation schedule. Uh, but there's no way that I can get it wrong this time because the next presenter is me. <laughs> um, I will present, be presenting Historically Hysterical, uh, which explores the historical reasons behind women's health and equity and how that affects women's health um, and health care today. Thank you for joining us this morning. And to thank you to Josh for participating in our virtual lecture series. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Yes, everyone. thank you everyone for watching. And I also threw my email there on the screen if anyone has future questions or anything. Um, but thank you everyone for listening in. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye.